Our next speaker is Jed Stuber, who's the head of the communications department at Samaritan Ministries International, which is a healthcare sharing ministry with more than 37,000 member households across the country and overseas. And each month, the members of Samaritan Ministries pray for each other and send more than $10 million directly to each other to share the expenses uh, of each other's health care needs. So very unique and very uh, much looking forward to hearing. Please uh, help me welcome Jed Stuber. Thank you for that introduction. Uh, we are very excited about what's going on at the uh, Free Market Medical Association at Samaritan Ministries. Uh, because those 37,000 member households that you just heard about are free market users. And we want to be able to connect our members with some of the services that many of you here can offer. Um, Samaritan is growing rapidly. We've seen about 20% net growth for the past four years running. And uh, there are days that we worry about what we would do if there were explosive or exp exponential growth and we're trying to get ready for that. Um, we're undertaking some new initiatives to build IT infrastructure and work more with partners and uh, make our services and partner services more available to our members online. Uh, one other exciting development at Samaritan is that one of our members, a documentary filmmaker named Colin Gunn, has just released a documentary on healthcare called Wait Till It's Free. And it dovetails perfectly with this conference, so I hope all of you will uh, take a look at that. I actually have copies out, out there that uh, I'd be happy to give you for a small donation. So um, <clears throat> I'll uh, try to show you a, a few clips from it today. Uh, my topic today is problems, benefits, and wants of free market users, and um, I'm going to tell you a little bit, little bit about how our members experience that. Man, if you can go to the next slide. Um, like I said, our members are cash pay, self pay patients, and so the main problem for them is they can't determine price, uh, like we've all been talking about already. Uh, the main benefit our members experience as free market users is they really are truly free to choose, especially they're free to choose their own providers. There's no network restrictions with our sharing ministry. Uh, the main want that our members have, I think, it's already been said again today, is they really want to be treated as the customer, but they are just not getting that experience in our current healthcare system dominated by third parties. So to uh, kick this off, I'm going to show you a little bit of a clip now from this documentary by Colin Gunn, Wait Till It's Free. And this features a, a member of ours who had some of the problems that we've been describing as a self-pay, cash pay patient. And yet he's one of these guys who kind of likes to fight the system, and he overcame. And uh, you'll see that in the clip. And, um, you know, not, not all of our members are like him, um, but he represents some of our members. So uh, why don't you go ahead and roll that. This is Roger Stuber. He was fit and healthy, but out of nowhere, something strange began to happen. I started noticing, at first what I thought was... Uh, just kind of some panic attacks. And I thought, well, you know, my business is, I got a lot of stress. I had a lot of new homes uh, that were being constructed. One thing that accompanied that was a taste in my mouth. It was the taste of cilantro. And pretty soon it was happening about once a week and then twice a week. And uh, before long, it was happening daily. And so I mentioned it to my, my family doctor. He says, you're having seizures. You need to see a neurologist. I want you to have an MRI immediately to see what's causing it. And so I did, and basically it is like a varicose vein in my brain that had sprung a leak. I found out where their finance offices were located, and I explained I didn't have insurance, and she says, now why do you not have insurance? I said, well, it's difficult. I'm a small, independent businessman. And her face actually lit up, and she says, I know. She says, my husband owns his own small business, and she says, we couldn't buy insurance either. That's why I work at the hospital, is to get insurance. And I said, okay, so you do understand my plight. Thankfully, Roger is doing well now and back at work. Roger's bill was nearly $70,000. There was such a discrepancy in the way that medical bills were being uh, billed to me. 
I had to have another MRI done at another hospital, and instead of an $1,800 bill for an identical test, I was billed $5,500. I said, you know, you're charging me $5,500 for an MRI. I also did a little further research and checked with an insurance company and find out that they pay you $750 for this test, and you willingly and gladly accept their $750. And she looked at me and she says, yes, but we have an agreement with the insurance company. I said, you know, that really isn't fair. And do you remember our friend Roger? He's a Samaritan Ministries member too. The beauty of this system is that there's no profit taking middleman. And members have an incentive like Roger did to be aware of costs. In fact, Roger successfully negotiated down the cost of his operation. For him, the pair will be another fellow Christian in the ministry not a nameless, faceless insurance agency. So you can see there that uh, Roger actually was able to negotiate uh, a discount for himself, and then the members of Samaritan Ministries sent him shares to pay for the remaining bills. And uh, I need to give you some background on uh, how Samaritan works, because I, I know it's a difficult um, concept to understand at first. Um, like I said, it's called a health care sharing ministry. Um, it's very important to understand that it is not insurance. It's not regulated as insurance. Uh, it's a 501c3 charitable ministry. You can go to the next slide there. Um, we actually have 28 states in our nation who have laws clarifying that health care sharing ministries are not insurance and uh, those, some of them date back to the 1980s when we refer to these laws as safe harbor laws. And then uh, also in the Federal uh, Affordable Care Act, Congress did put an exemption in there for members of healthcare sharing ministries so they're not subject to the individual mandate to the penalty tax for not having insurance. And how that got in there is quite a story. I'll have to tell you some other time. But uh, we're seeing a lot of growth. Uh, this is driving members to us. Um, yeah, this slide tells you about how the sharing process works. Um, each member is just sending a set share amount every month. It's currently $405 for a family of any size, and the shares are sent directly through the mail to another member household, to members with needs. And they're not sending it into our office. Basically, all we're doing back at Samaritan is we're using a database that randomly matches shares to needs so that sharing is coordinated and shares go to the appropriate members with the needs. And in this way, we're sharing about $10 million a month in health care bills this way. But how does it work on the other side? Um, if a member has what we call a need and needs to be receiving shares, well, this member just goes to a provider of his choice, deals directly with that provider, gets billed directly by that provider, collects his bills, he'll send a copy into Samaritan Ministries, and at Samaritan all we do is we verify that the need meets our sharing guidelines, and then we direct some members to send the shares to that member with the need. He receives checks in the mail, he cashes the checks, pays his doctor. That's how it works in a nutshell. Go to the next slide now. Uh, I mentioned to you our sharing guidelines, and uh, you may be wondering about that. <clears throat> You might be thinking, hey, there's the fine print, that's the catch. That might be how Samaritan uh, dictates the medical care our members receive. But that's certainly not our intent. We want to respect the doctor-patient relationship. And uh, I've brought some copies of our guideline books out on the table. If you want to pick one up, you're more than welcome to grab one. Um, they're also publicly available on our website. The first thing to realize when you look at Samaritan Ministries guidelines is that there's no health screening when joining Samaritan Ministries. Members are required, though, to subscribe to a basic Christian statement of faith, attend church regularly, and <clears throat> have their pastor sign to verify that. Um, the guidelines we try to keep in plain language. We believe that the man in the street can read them and comprehend them. They are the broad principles, and they're intended to leave the member and the doctor to work out the details of their treatment. The way our guideline works, according to um, our guidelines, any medical need that totals less than $300 is something that we don't share and members are supposed to budget for and take care of outside of the sharing. Um, 
and we share up to $250,000 in our main program. We actually also have a secondary program that about half of our membership belongs to for needs that are larger than that. So when we describe our Samaritan Ministries guidelines back at the office, one thing we say is there's an assumption built within them, and that is we share it unless we don't. Um, if you have a medical need that turns into a major expense, you have to go to a doctor for any reason or a hospital, it's going to be more than $300. The presumption is it's going to be shared in most cases, unless we have some sort of specific guideline saying that we won't share it. So now you're wondering what is not shared. Well, there's some basic reasons. One reason is we wouldn't share some things for ethical reasons, like we don't share abortion. And we're obviously able to do that on our, because of our religious faith. Um, there's other limitations in our guidelines that are just basic matters of the practical concern of keeping expenses down and not overwhelming the ministry, driving the shares up too high. For example, our approach to prescription medications is that we share for a 90-day period. We don't do ongoing chronic medications. Now our members have to find other solutions in those areas. And of course, there's the area of pre-existing uh, conditions. And I think we're able to take a pretty flexible approach here. Uh, let me tell you how this works. Um, again, no one is prevented from joining the ministry on basis of health. If you have a pre-existing condition, you can come into the ministry. We won't share needs for that condition, but you can have other conditions shared. And if you can go at any time a year without symptoms or treatment of that condition, we would no, cons no longer consider it pre-existing. And we sometimes rely on doctors for help here. We have a form called a doctor verification form. But listen carefully to how we use it. We send the form out to the member, and we say, take that form to your doctor, have a discussion with your doctor, and then send the form back to us. Again, we're trying not to interfere with the doctor-patient relationship there. So there are a couple of exceptions to this 12-month symptom and treatment-free guideline for pre-existing conditions. If you have heart disease or cancer, you need to go five years without treatment before we would share it again. Uh, for diabetes, someone must go 12 months without symptoms or treatment and also have an AA1C test of seven or below. So that's basically how it works. Um, we also say when we're comparing it to insurance plans, and again, I would caution you there because we're not insurance and we don't use any insurance terminology. We're a very different thing, but... We say that we're similar to a major medical approach. It's not totally comprehensive. There's no illusion that it's supposed to take care of everything. However, we do have members who tell us they used to have gold-plated or Cadillac insurance plans, and they much prefer the plan they have now with Samaritan. One of our marketing slogans you'll see is, sick of insurance? Come join us. And we get people for that reason a lot. Members often tell us of bad experiences they had with an insurance plan, and it didn't come through for them in the way that they perceived that it should. And now that they have the very understandable approach of the Samaritan Ministries guidelines, they much prefer that. But again, comparing us with insurance always breaks down at some point. The important thing, I think, for our conference here today about our guidelines and our approach for sharing these needs is that our guidelines were simply developed in a voluntary way with a basic market conditions in mind. Anybody interested can read them, decide if they like that approach or not. We actually, these guidelines really haven't changed in 20 years that we've been operating. They made sense to us 20 years ago when we started and they worked pretty well along the way. Now one more thing that you'll learn about in our uh, guidelines, and go to the next slide, um, yeah, is the charitable aspect of our ministry. Um, we think the combination of free market principles along with true charity can be very powerful, and Samaritan is one example of that. Obviously, our ministry isn't going to meet all needs. Um, some members are going to have some expense for whatever reason that falls outside the guidelines, and they're going to need help. Well, the way we can address this is we just tell our members about these special situations. We call them special prayer needs. We draw attention to them, and we even will put in, if everybody were able to send X dollars donation this month, extra money above your share, then we could take care of all these special prayer needs. And we find that people are very generous. Even people, many of Samaritan members who are 
at or below the poverty line. And we're still able to take care of these special needs. And we can meet a lot of them in this way. Many of these special prayer needs are pre-existing conditions. Quite a few of them actually come in for dental bills when people are surprised for thousands of dollars worth of uh, dental bills they're not able to take care of. Again, we think this is just a free market approach along with charity that works. Um, now, I've been explaining this all to you um, on the individual member level, but I want to step back now and take a look at uh, the bigger picture from Samaritan's perspective. You can go to the next slide. What happens if there are more needs and bills coming in in a given month than shares? Well, let's say that $10 million in bills are submitted in a given month, but there's only $9 million in shares available. What we do is we use a simple prorating method and we only publish 90%. We only share 90% of each need. So that means some of these people with needs in that month could have out-of-pocket expenses. But again, this is where the charity comes in. Members are encouraged to give an additional gift that month to these prorated needs. And we've been refining our tracking of these prorated needs over the years. For the last six or seven years, we know that the extra given has extra giving above and beyond the share in the prorated months has always been enough to take care of the prorated needs. That means none of our members are ending up stuck with a big financial burden that they have to pay for out of pocket. And they like to remind us of stories they had with their previous insurance plans and how 80-20 policies and high deductibles often left them with big expenses. We actually at this moment have a pretty big surplus of member donations built up for the next time this type of prorating would happen. Now if it becomes chronic, if prorating happens over and over again, if it happens three months in a row, members are actually presented with a proposal to vote on raising the share amount. And 60% of those voting must approve it for the share to be raised. It's a truly member-controlled ministry. We have nine people on our board of directors, and they aren't on the board because of any being a major donor or a fundraiser. Six of them are just members, elected by the members, and they cannot receive any compensation from the ministry. The three other board members are our founder and a couple of people he appoints. So you can see that the members always hold the balance of power over anyone receiving compensation from the ministry. So we have people every day who uh, ask a similar question um, that our last speaker mentioned. This sounds too good to be true. In fact, one of the things you'll see in our marketing materials, we have a piece called, How Can the Monthly Share Be So Low? It's only $400 a month. Well, there's a lot of reasons it can be so low. You can go to the next slide there. Yeah, just go ahead and put those up. Um, first of all, members pray. We depend on God, and God answers prayer. For us, it's all about our faith. It's very faith-based. Uh, we receive reports every day of how God is healing people, God is providing for people. Also, our members have a Christian conscience, and they agree to live in a way that reduces health care problems. They don't abuse alcohol or drugs. Um, they abstain from sexual activity outside of traditional biblical marriage. These commitments by all the members protect them from health problems and free them from unwillingly supporting those who choose to live in unbiblical ways. And I think our members are also highly motivated to keep costs down. They know that that share is coming from another individual. They're having that individual act interaction every month. And so they're avoiding unnecessary treatments. They're looking for cost-saving measures to receive their needed medical care. The other thing is Samaritan members... <clears throat> really only give for what happens, not what might happen. There's no big financial reserve that's being managed and invested. So, finally, uh, Samaritan Ministries' direct sharing approach also can help keep the administrative costs low. Basically, our ministry is funded by uh, a fee from new members when they start, but then one share a year is sent into Samaritan Ministries, and every time a member sends a check, a share. They always know where the money is going. So I hope you'll see that our members truly are free market users and Samaritan is not getting between the doctor and the patient. Um, they're choosing their own providers. There's no provider network. Members are dealing with doctors. Samaritan's not dictating the treatment. Members are billed directly by the provider and they're responsible to pay their own bills. Samaritan doesn't even have contact with the providers. 
The result of all of this is that we often get interesting letters. I'll read you one that I, we just got last month from a farmer in Indiana. His name's John. This is what he writes. I injured my shoulder working on a piece of farm equipment last spring, and the pain persisted, so I went to a doctor. After an MRI, he said I needed surgery, and I asked how much it would cost. He said it was going to be about $26,000 plus the costs of two or three months' worth of therapy. But I started talking to him about what could be done about the cost if I would pay cash. We ended up paying a little over $6,000 for the surgery, and I did the therapy myself. When I was receiving those checks in the mail, accompanied with cards from all over the country, it was such a humbling experience to know that they were lifting me up in prayer. I returned to my doctor 10 weeks after my surgery to be released, and he was amazed at the mobility I had in my shoulder. He said I was two months ahead of schedule. Thank you for all the wonderful work you're doing. So I hope that gives you an overview of how Samaritan works in a nutshell, and next I want to move on to telling you more about why we do the things the way we do. You can go to the Next slide here. As we're telling people about how this all works, we get lots of reactions. Are you nuts? Is this legal? That'll never work. Sounds terribly inefficient. Some people say, say that sounds nice, but it'll never work for large bills or for very long. Some people, the Christian part of it appeals to them, and they say at least it's Christian, so I'll try it. Other people it does not appeal to, and they say, huh, that's probably just another way religion is used to exploit people. A lot of people who are coming and joining and really are, they're saying, I don't really have another option. And then finally, there's people that come to us and they say, this sounds like the kind of community I've always wanted to find for health care and always wanted to be part of. I wish I had known about this years ago. Sign me up today. So I think all these reactions begin to get at why we do what we do. What's the philosophy, the worldview, the biblical principles behind what we do? And like I said, at Samaritan, it's all about our faith. Go to the next slide. First, uh, we just believe that God commands us to do this in the Bible. We believe that our ministry is actually part of the Great Commission. And as we love people and give glory to God, people come to know Him. We're commanded all throughout Scripture to love each other. And uh, one passage that we often refer to is Galatians chapter 6, which says, Bear one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. And that's how we try to keep the emphasis at Samaritan Ministries, on bearing one another's burdens in a way that brings glory to God. It's not about what you can get out of it. It's not about putting your faith in some system that's going to take care of everything and provide you health care security. It's not about the illusion of a perfect plan that will take care of everything. So, as we trust God, obey His Word, put into practice the principles He gives us, including free market <laughs> principles, He blesses our ministry. When it comes to the free market, we would say at Samaritan that liberty comes from God, and if you put the next bullet point up, the Bible is the basis for a free market. Now, if any of you here actually believe otherwise, we think it's because you're stealing from the Christian worldview, stealing from the Bible, even if you don't realize it. I'll show you a statement on the next slide from a Christian economist. He says, Ownership is ultimately theocentric. It is God-centered. He created all that exists, and he is at the center of the universe as its owner. This means ownership is ultimately a religious concept it cannot be properly understood without reference to God as the absolute owner of the creation. Similarly, it is impossible to discuss properly the responsibilities of ownership without also discussing what God specifically requires of men in their capacity as owners. If you go to the next slide, and go ahead and put all those up, I think we could argue that all of these free market concepts come from the Bible. Stewardship of resources, property rights as a foundation for human rights, serving others as the key to economic success, honesty and integrity and hard work, the diversity of gifts and talents as the basis for the division of labor. If I had time, I would give you chapter and verse and commentary on all of this. But theologians have actually traced all these things back to the very nature of God. They say that the basis for any cooperative endeavor is actually the Trinity, God himself is the one and the many. He is the model for the unity and the diversity that is necessary for the market to thrive. And the list goes on. If you go to the next slide, 
what about the conditions of government that are necessary for uh, a free market to thrive? I think all these things also have their root in the Bible. Um, how many of you would say, if I ask you the question, what is the proper role of government in the market? Raise your hand if you think it's to strangle the market with regulations, create all kinds of perverse incentives, confiscate wealth through taxation, redistribute wealth through entitlements, scare capital into hiding, consolidate power in the hands of a few, and buy and sell political favors. Yeah, we don't think so either. But raise your hand if you think the role of the state in the market is none. I knew I was going to get a few hands. We at Samaritan would actually push back against that. Uh, we do think the Bible would suggest there is a legitimate role for the state and the authorities to catch and punish liars and thieves. And other than that, stay out of it. <laughs> Basically, it's to enforce contracts. So, you know, if the state were in its proper role, then strong families and churches can drive innovation in the free market to meet health care needs. And all of these things used to be much better understood in our culture. And I've got some quotes from our founding fathers, if you want to put the next one up. Here's Thomas Jefferson. He said, a wise and frugal government shall restrain men from injuring one another, shall leave them otherwise free to regulate their own pursuits of industry and improvement, and shall not take from the mouth of labor the bread it has earned. This is the sum of good government. Go ahead, next slide. George Washington, a people who are possessed of the spirit of commerce, who see and who will pursue their advantages, may achieve almost anything. Next. Uh, this one's by James Madison. He says, Just government, which impartially secures to every man whatever his own. Go ahead to the next one. And there's John Adams. He says, The moment that an idea is admitted into society that, pro that property is not as sacred as the laws of God, that there is not a force of law and public justice to, to protect it, anarchy and tyranny commence. If thou shalt not covet, and thou shalt not steal, were not commandments of heaven, they must be made invaluable precepts in every society before it can be civilized or made free. So we'd actually agree with these things. Speaking of this era of a time gone by when these things were better understood, I want to tell you about a new health care policy paper that just came out from the Heartland Institute. You can go to the next slide. It's by Greg Scandlin, and uh, it's called Safe Haven. Go ahead and put all those up. Now, for the sake of time, I'll skip over most of this, but he tells uh, the history of the last two centuries how in Great Britain and then in the U.S., ordinary working people banded together to provide a wide range of mutual assistance, including health care, including medical care, and mutual aid societies. For, unfortunately, over time, these self-help organizations were displaced, but Scanlon actually sees a reemergence of these sorts of societies, and he says healthcare sharing ministries, while rudimentary today, will likely blossom with the help of social media. Well, that resonates with us at Samaritan Ministries. Um, I wish he would have said something other than while rudimentary today. Uh, we, I think maybe he's getting at that uh, there is a lot of development to go still. And like I said, we're beginning to develop a lot more uh, IT infrastructure and uh, relationship with partners, and we're excited to meet many of you here. But let's return back to our topic now of uh, problems, benefits, and wants of free market users. You can go to the next slide. Okay, Dr. Smith is right when he says price transparency is the heart of the matter. That's the biggest frustration our members have, and they want to know what prices are. Uh, I believe we have time here. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and roll a clip from the movie that features Dr. Smith. If a top-down healthcare system is imposed by government, it's very likely to be bad news for life and liberty. Now, I wanted to give you the bad news first before I told you the possibility of a cure, and the good news is that the antidote is right there in front of us. Dr. Keith Smith runs a private surgery center in Oklahoma City. What he does here is revolutionary and turns everything in its head simply by taking several bold steps. We bought an old, mismanaged, burnout surgery center in 1997. And, and thought we would be different in a couple of ways. We, we decided we would practice price honesty. We put our prices online 
partly to expose the cartel and the price fixing that was going on. Remember the charge master with the hidden prices and the guessing game patients were involved in? The buyer doesn't know what the prices are. She said, no, it's $20,000. This is the opposite, pure price transparency. On their website, you can click on a link and find out exactly the cost of any operation. Within six months, we knew that the prices that we were quoting to patients were many times a tenth of what the so-called not-for-profit hospitals that we had just left claimed were bankrupting them. So we knew very, very soon that we were right. And the most amazing thing that happened was Canadians showed up. They were the first patients to get here. Well, that's funny. Yeah, terribly funny. People that have universal access to care, supposedly, but they were coming all the way to Oklahoma City to pay cash for, you know, their, to have their gallbladder removed or have their child's tonsils removed. Dr. Smith told me something unbelievable about hospital billing, that both the hospitals and the insurance companies wanted those high bills so that they could capitalize on the difference between the high bill and what is actually paid. Insurance companies are perversely inclined to seek out the most gigantic hospital bills that they can find. That sounds crazy when I say that. A hospital issues a bill for $100,000 and the insurance company through their PPO reprices it to $20,000. And then they write in to the employer group and say, we've, you know, we've saved you $80,000 and now you can pay us a percentage of that $80,000 savings. The hospitals are happy to accept $20,000 for a for $100,000 bill because that $80,000 fictional loss helps them maintain that fiction of their not-for-profit status, and it goes into their uncompensated care pool that they then stick to the taxpayers and get a rebate on that really nobody talks about. I call it the uncompensated care scam. Because to the extent the hospitals claim they lost money, they actually made money. When hospitals wave their charity flag and say, well, but we take care of the indigent, they don't really. While they're waving the, the charity flag with one hand, they're fleecing the taxpayer with the other hand. I think our members are waking up to these realities. And when educated, they're capable of great creativity in exercising their freedom in the market. Um, you can go ahead and put those up and I'll conclude here. I think free market users, our members, are very well positioned for the health care challenges that are coming. They don't have to look to policymakers. Solutions are available now if you have the faith and the courage to exercise your freedom. I think that's the message of the movie, so I encourage you to get a copy of it. They're already doing something innovating. They are better positioned to meet challenges and adapt to changes. We say that we've been doing social media in analog form at Samaritan Ministries for 20 years, and we find that our members thrive online in the social media area era. You can go to the next slide. What are the wants of free market users? Again, it's just to be treated as the customer, not patronized, treated as second class. They want information to make cost value assessments. They want the freedom to act in their self-interest. And we find that when they have that freedom, they will also be frugal, sacrificial, and generous to others. It's all about freedom. So with that, I'll conclude. And uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Jen. Thank you very much. We do have questions. Sure. Charlie, you really have one. <laughs> and I do have a question this time. Jed, first off, I want to thank you for being here and uh, Samaritan support of what we're doing. Uh, I think one of the things that Greg uh, might have been referring to is that right now Samaritan and the other ministries are, are religious based. So, mm -hmm. uh, do you see, uh, I mean, I know that you're talking of economics, but do you see an, ab an ability to expand this outside of? Uh, the religious area, and I, I guess if you guys talked about that, or what are you seeing in the market? Yeah, there is uh, one organization that started up more on ethical grounds. There's that room within the uh, exemption that's written in the Affordable Care Act. So um, there's really only half a dozen major players right now in healthcare sharing, and then we found out that all kinds of small Mennonite groups ended up 
applying for the exemption as well. But yeah, there's one organization that it's not necessarily a religious um, requirement as part of membership. Um, I think as Samaritan, we'd argue that that's essential to what we're doing, but we would want as many as possible healthcare sharing ministries out there to thrive. We would love to see that. We work closely with some of the other ministries on public policy issues and are in regular contact with them. Uh, I didn't mean to respond to, I uh, didn't get up to respond to what you, the question that you asked, but uh, my dad actually runs one of those small Mennonite groups, uh, and that's my background, and part of the reason that I'm here is because they are cash users, free market users, uh, Amish and Mennonite, tremendous, uh, you know, tens of thousands of patients in Northeast Ohio, where I'm from, that uh, pay cash for everything. Uh, so, but, and I think one of the reasons that, that the healthcare sharing ministry resonates with people uh, outside that group is they they see I think that there's um, a the, it, the way that it's described is it's kind of a, it's almost a homogeneous user population in a way and they have sort of this thing that binds them together and that's part of why it works as well the question that I have for you Jeb is uh, uh, there's quite an emphasis on on patient privacy uh, in the 21st century do your patients ever have a problem with like Hey, you're you're actually going to send people my name and address and tell them what's wrong with me and 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 so that they can send me money. Uh, we'll occasionally get a comment about that, but very few people, you know, at our ministry believe in the power of prayer. They want support from the community, and we don't necessarily have to give every gory detail of the condition. We can give a general description. So my name is Lee Gross. I'm a direct primary care provider, founder of Epiphany Health in Southwest Florida. It seems like you have the population of patients that all of us that are doing free market medicine want to reach out to. Um, and I'm just wondering what the ministry is doing to sort of connect the two of us together so that we have access to the patients that are seeking us out. Yeah. Um, we first at the very least want to educate our members as much as possible. We have a newsletter where we regularly cover all kinds of free market topics. We did a feature on the surgery center and we've done on some done stories on concierge practices, cash pay friendly practices. So we can educate our members in the general that way. But like I said, we're also developing uh, IT infrastructure. We've got a platform built now and we're holding regular developer and partner summits. And we've got some partners already developing on that platform and, uh, so we're making it seamless so a member can actually just sign in as a Samaritan member and also maybe have access to Metabid, for example, or some, some other service. We've got a telemedicine service and a prescription discount plan that we're bringing in that way. So, you know, every organization I hear about here, I think, wow, wouldn't that be neat if we could connect? And um, we've talked about... Um, you know, um, subscription-based, membership-based doctors, and if there's any way we could maybe make a change in our guidelines to incentivize members to use some of those practices, and we haven't cracked that nut yet, but we'd be willing to talk to you. Hope that answers the question. Other questions? So I just wanted to clarify, so your patients pay cash up front out of their own pockets and get reimbursed? No, they don't pay up front in all cases. In some cases they do. Um, in most cases, the member goes to the provider and gets billed, okay? And they have to turn the copy of the bill into us. We have to verify it. We have to, in the next month, allocate the shares to them. We actually find that providers once they learn about how it works, we're actually turning it all around, believe it or not, faster than insurance. So some providers, once they learn about it, they're fine with them, uh, fine with our members. Um, our members do get overbilled and overcharged quite a lot, and so we're working on solutions there too. I'll just share a quick endorsement just so people in the room that are a little skeptical uh, don't think that this is just for religious nuts. Um, <laughs> I'm a physician. I'm a sol in solo practice. I own my own business. I'm a husband and a father, and I'm a Samaritan member. And I've used it to have a baby, to have my kids have ear tubes. 
it works. This isn't just some pipe dream where, oh, you're going to sign up, but it's not really going to happen. I mean, when my wife had a baby, the bill, now we were unfortunate enough to be, have a good relationship with an OB at an academic center, and they were in nearly impossible to deal with, despite how much I knew about CPT coding and fee schedules and master charges and all that sort of stuff, I could not negotiate the hospital bill down below $12,000. But we paid it, turned it into Samaritan, and six weeks later, I got about 45 cards in the mail with prayers and checks and paid my bill in full. It works. Yeah, we find that a lot of, and I didn't pay him, by the way. <laughs> I didn't know he was going to be here. But uh, members, once they have the first need experience, then they're really bought into the community aspects of it and how important that is. And they'll say that that was so much more important than getting the bills paid uh, is the support they receive through the ministry. As a segue to that, I, I just wanted to say that patients are finding direct pay physicians that are members of Samaritan. I'm lucky enough to have three families on my panel. Two of them found me through the, the link on your website where doctors can list. And the other one stumbled on to me uh, because Samaritan popped up on my website somehow and they saw it and clicked. Um, so it, it does work. They're finding us. What about churches that are large enough to help with their own, help their, like the staffs with their, uh, are, are you approaching churches almost like you would approach a business, basically? Yes. Um, we've run into a complication there with um, some larger groups had used it in conjunction with health reimbursement arrangements but that's not working any longer with uh, the Affordable Care Act. And, you know, if it's large employers, they have the employer mandate to deal with. And we're actually working with Ralph from Metabid to come up with some solutions on that. And I think he's going to be here later today or tomorrow. And uh, he could actually probably tell you more than I could about that. But, yeah, we have some churches and employers and schools that use it for their staff. Well, join me in thanking Jed Stuber. Yes.